Hi, everyone. How y'all doing? Okay. We are at the first ever SF Queer Comics Fest Pride and Panels. How are you all doing? Yes. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, everyone. My name is Christina Mitra, pronouns she, her, Edya, and I am the program manager here at the Hormel LGBTQIA Center of San Francisco Public Library. I am so thrilled that you're here, that everyone out there is enjoying themselves, and that we're doing this. This is honestly one huge experiment. And so far, I think it's working. So thank you for being part of this experiment. Thank you for being part of the community here. The Hormel LGBTQI Center was the very first center of its kind in a municipal public building. So for a government building to have a place for our community in 1996 was groundbreaking. And at this point right now, as far as I can tell, you are welcome to correct me, we're the only urban public library anywhere in the United States. I have venture to say even the world that has a center like ours. So I'm very, very proud of the work we do. I don't want us to be the first and I don't, well, I don't want us to be the only. I want there to be centers like this in every part of the country and the world in small towns and suburban towns. And so I hope that that won't be the case for forever. But for now, we are, and we're unique in that way, and I welcome you to learn more about us and explore what we have for you, which is an array of queer and trans books. We've got incredible archives documenting the queer history of San Francisco. Um, if you have any questions about any of that, our table's out there. We've got the purple tablecloth number 24, and we'd love to answer your questions. Um, so before I continue on, I do want to go ahead and make sure that we acknowledge the land that we are on. Let's see, I'm trying to get a slide here. There we go. So the San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Ramatush Ohlone understand the interconnectedness of all things and have maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor the Ramatush Ohlone peoples for their enduring commitment to Mother Earth. As indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place as well for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereignty as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone people. We recognize and respectfully honor that in order to respectfully honor and embrace the Ramatush people, we must collaborate meaningfully with them to record indigenous knowledge and in how we care for San Francisco and all its people. So let that be both an acknowledgement and also a call to action for all of us to build relationships with our local indigenous communities. Thank you. Without further ado, I wanna welcome up our amazing all ages panel coming up right here. Ooh. Our clicker is having some fun times with us today. Media services team, if there's any support you can offer me, that would be awesome. Thank you. Uh, while they're doing that, I do want to give a shout out to our incredible media services team. They're making sure that we have sound and audio and they're recording this so that people can see it in the future. Um, so I want to give a big shout out to them. And also to our custodial team who set up all the tables and chairs outside and are going to do the cleanup afterwards. We thank them. And also the friends of the San Francisco Public Library, without whom none of this could have been possible. Thank you. All right, let's bring it up. Let's give it up for our panel here. Think of the children, queer all ages comics. I want to welcome our moderator, Laura Gao. Can we give Laura some love? And we've got our incredible panel here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say their names. I want Mance, please come on up. Woo! Kyla Iko Smith. Samadrita Sam Ghosh, 
and Amanda Castillo. Please welcome them all warmly. Sweet. Thank you all. Oh. Hello. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming out. I'm so, so stoked to have this wonderful group of panelists. My name is Laura Gao. Pronouns are she and they. I'm a local Bay Area based comic artist and writer who writes primarily for young adults and children's. So it is in my passion to be able to connect with all of y'all amazing artists and writers who also write for all ages. So I'm going to do a very quick intro of each of y'all and then they will have um, a couple of slides about their wonderful work to share with y'all. We'll have a short Q&A about everything, your work, writing for kids, drawing for kids. And then lastly, in the five minutes, y'all will get an opportunity to ask them any question you want. So keep that in mind, you know, write all your questions down, get ready for that. But um, make sure to just leave your questions until the very end, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. So first here on my left is Awan Mance. Awan is a professor of African American literature at Mills College in Oakland, California. A lifelong artist and writer, Awan has participated in solo and group exhibitions, as well as comic and zine fests from the Bay Area all the way to Brooklyn. In her art, illustration, and comics, Awan uses humor and bright colors to explore race, gender, power, and the people and places in which they intersect. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. Thank you. Awesome. Next we have Kyla Aiko. Kyla Aiko is a cartoonist and editor who's always looking for good soup noodle recommendation. You'll have to give us some later on. <laughs> and the spicier, the better. She's currently working on Foxlight, her debut middle grade graphic novel about a lost fox spirit and the non-binary noodle maker who helps him find his way home. Yeah, cute, cute. Yes, please, please ask Kyla about it after. All right, next we have Sam, also known as Tickle. Tickle is an illustrator from India, learning about comics at CCA in San Francisco. Her favorite thing to draw is casual intimacy between characters. She likes to capture a comfy, loving vibe with her illustrations, and when not drawing, she's usually having an existential revelation, same, and or petting her dog. Very cute, what kind of dog? She's a mixed breed. Mixed breed, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Favor and German Spitz. Oh, adorable, okay. I hope you put pictures in your slides. All right, last but not least, Amanda Castillo. Amanda is a cartoonist and illustrator who loves to share memorable and heartfelt stories through drawings, words, or both. They are the illustrator and co-author of the middle grade graphic novel trilogy, Map Makers, which you've brought here, um, and are cooking up their next comics to one day share with y'all. So one round of applause for all of our panelists. <laughs> all right. So first we have Awan sharing about her work. Um, and uh, can you hear me? Great. Um, my uh, comics, um, and I should also mention that I am a visiting professor of illustration at uh, CCA and Sam is my amazing TA in our queer illustration course. Um, um, I am, um, my comics, um, I wanted to show a few images. Um, I started doing comics in 2014, mostly autobiographical with a twist. I can't time travel, but I can in my comics. Um, and Gender <laughs> Studies is the collection that um, I, um, is officially out on March 4th, um, but I, that I have with me today. Um, and it looks back on some funny and interesting moments um, from my life, uh, college and backwards. Um, those moments in which being a genderqueer black nerd makes things extra funny or awkward or interesting. Um, and drawings of uh, you know um, kids and childhood plays an important role in me telling these stories. For example, this, these are some images from a story in which I look back on probably the first genderqueer person I ever met when I was in second grade. Um, a student I will refer to as Tiffany Banks. Um, the uh, notion of uh, black women's hair and how my own hair journey played an interesting and important role in my evolution as a uh, genderqueer person. Um, and also the journey of my uh, niece uh, as uh, you know, 
dealing with three and four year olds as they're trying to figure out questions of gender. Um, I love comic strips. I think it's a beautiful, wonderful form. And so I've also explored the uh, three and four panel comic strip in comics called Check All That Apply, Black Nerd Stories. Um, and um, yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Kyla Aiko. I use she and they pronouns. Uh, this is just my icon. Um, so what I'm here to talk about mostly is I'm the author and artist of a, series, or a book called Foxlight coming out from Fiwa and Friends uh, Macmillan um, in 2027. And so these are some earlier um, illustrations from my pitch and from the announcement. Uh, a lot of stuff I'm working on is secret, but hopefully I can share more in the near future. Um, I'm also one of five artists on the Freddie Mercury Shadows Illuminated um, comic from Z2 Comics. Um, we had yeah, some amazing artists I'm in the company of and two writers, and it was just a really cool project to be a part of, especially um, just being able to work on a Freddie Mercury comic. Um, I'm also one of 29 uh, trans and non-binary creators in The Outside, which is a collection of short comics about, um, autobiographical comics about being trans and non-binary. Um, I also letter manga, manhwa, and uh, Western comics like Jungle Juice, Dan Dan Dan, um, and Everything is Fine. So these are some comics I've worked on, and it's also very really fun and fulfilling in different ways to connect in like children's media in yeah, different ways. Uh, finally, I'm also one of the members of Utot Comics. Utot means fart in Tagalog, and it's a group of um, comic creators who realized we weren't spending enough time making short comics just for our own enjoyment, um, whether it be day jobs or just other work that was kind of not letting us be as creative as we wanted to. So we work on comic sprints and just encourage each other to just make comics. Uh, my name is Sam, and if you're aware of me on the internet, you probably know me as Ticklil. I am illustrator, wrist pain haver, former insomniac, and all these things that I'm mentioning here. <laughs> Usually, I started, uh, so I started my art journey with in the world of illustration, and uh, this is some of the examples. Like I have a series of illustrations that I have here with me today. Um, and as you can see, I like working with lights and creating a mood using like uh, environment, surroundings, and just stuff like that. Sometimes I also do fan art. This is uh, some of my recent fan art where, as I said in my intro, I like to explore casual intimacy between characters. Uh, that is usually because uh, I am an asexual person, and right now in my comics journey, I'm trying to Ex, like explore some more of that. Um, so casual intimacy really plays a huge role in that. So I'm trying to uh, have more of my work echo that sentiment. Uh, so if you're interested in any of that, you should totally come by my table and check out some of my stuff. Today, mostly I'll be talking about my work on Night Owls and Summer Skies, which was a Webtoon original series that aired in 2022. Uh, it is about lesbian icon, Emma, Emma Lynn, <laughs> who gets unceremoniously dumped into a summer camp against her wishes. But wait a second, the counselor is kind of hot. <laughs> we are going to probably, hopefully, talk about that a little bit more in the panel. So I hope you're looking forward to that. <laughs> this is them. This, this should give you an idea of what, what the whole vibe is like. <laughs> and with that, here is everywhere you can find me. And that was me, Sam. Thank you for visiting. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Castillo. I am a cartoonist and illustrator born and raised here in the Bay Area. Um, I am the artist and co-author on the children's book series Map Makers from Random House Graphic, which is what I've been working on for like the past four or five years or so. Um, and previously I had work published with Boom Studios, Lion Forge, and College Humor. Um, so Map Makers is a series about a young girl who finds a lost map in her hometown 
And she finds out that her land was once glorious and beautiful and is now desolate. And so she sets out on a journey while meeting other kids just like her um, to restore their land to what it once was after or before it was taken over by a group called the Nightcoats. Um, and so the first two books are out and the last book is set to release in April this year. Um, and I always like to show, oh wait, hold on. I was just, I'm just the illustrator on that one. Um, and so now that I'm done with that project, um, I'm sort of barreling into working on my own stuff. Um, and so this is just a little bit of an excerpt from a pitch that I'm working on for a graphic novel um, aimed at teens. And I can't say too, too much yet since it's still in the works, but it will be one that explores how discovering identity as a, like cultural identity kind of intersects with uh, queer identity and how they kind of interplay with each other and um, inform each other and one's existence. But yeah. Awesome, thank you. I'm, yeah, thank you so much. So I think one thing that's very clear from hearing about all y'all introduce your works is that y'all have all come from such diverse backgrounds of how you got into comics and how you started making all ages comics too. Like we have folks like Tickle who mainly did like web comics and webtoons all the way to Awan who's probably our most seasoned like veteran in the comics industry here with so many books, right? Um, so I'd love to just go down the road. Maybe we can just start from Amanda first and then come down since you're fresh off the mic. Why don't you just quickly introduce sort of your comics journey? We have a lot of young faces here who you know, are looking up to y'all and want to be y'all soon. So what was your comics journey like to get to here today? And then why did you decide to create For All Ages? Okay. Um, so I went to school out on the East Coast. I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art. And I didn't really know that I wanted to do comics until I got there. And the reason why I kind of got into comics is because there's like a lot of like small press shows out on the East Coast. And that's sort of how I got like, um, like the, our department was generous enough to fund a table for students, um, which I'm extremely thankful for. Um, so then I kind of just used that opportunity to start making, I've always had characters in my head. Um, and so I started putting them into comics. And so a lot of those kind of, because I was young at the time, well, I mean, I still am young, <laughs> um, but, a lot of them kind of coincided with like my own experiences. So that fell more in line with like uh, teenagers, younger kids, um, just what I knew. And um, so then that's sort of where like the, the, the kind of comics that I was making. So about like friendship, about like growing up. And I've always kind of been a sucker for coming of age. So I kind of feel like it kind of just naturally, I like naturally fell into that spot. Um, but then the more, when I started getting smaller jobs, um, I realized that I enjoyed seeing how kids would react to these comics. And it kind of mirrored the same way that I would feel as a kid, um, reading a lot of comics. I read a lot of manga um, and like the Sunday like sillies and stuff. Okay. Um, and I just like, there was just something so like enticing and magical about that um, because it was just their, the joy that kids have for comics is like so like pure and like passion filled. Um, and I just, I wanted to be able to be someone who can make something for, because as like a queer kid, I didn't know, like there wasn't as much stuff or it was harder to find stuff that like I could relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to be um, someone who like helped like create stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of just like how I fell into it. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. No, I, I totally agree. Like, yeah, thank you so much. I um, feel like a lot of folks, no matter what generation you are, right? Like growing up, you probably didn't have as much. And now we have so many amazing creators. So yeah. All right, Sam. Right, uh, so I'm pretty new to the world of comics. Like all my life, I've mostly been um, like an artist and an illustrator, animator for a short period of time. Uh, but growing up, I definitely remember being uh, like very distinctly inspired by the Tintin comics, especially like the clean line style. 
And as a kid who relied a lot on line art, I really sort of fell into that. I was like, what if I try to, you know, make comics that uses lines like that? And that went on to like inform my art style later in life. Like even even now, I rely like on my line art, and I'm like really proud of my line art. Uh, so that I would say it was my biggest inspiration. Uh, the other one would be uh, being an Indian and Bengali kid. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, know Satyajit Ray, uh, the famous Indian film director, and he's like my biggest inspiration because he he made films, he illustrated his own stories, he wrote, he did graphic design, he was he he did it all. Uh, so I was l like very very inspired by uh, comic adaptations of his sh his detective short story series uh, Feluda. Um, and as a kid, I remember I'd like make uh, fan art comics of my favorite anime, where I was acutely aware of the Begdil test as a kid, where I was like, hey, the girls never talk to each other. What's going on? <laughs> so, I, so I would make like fan art comics and put all the girls together and you know send them on a beach holiday or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I would be like, yeah, I'm living my dreams. Like, I'll make all the Disney princesses interact, and all the uh, female ninja from Naruto, they would all have a fun time. Like, no men in sight. I, I would do that. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's kind of how I grew up with comics. And uh, yeah, right now, it's mostly webtoons. And I'm learning more about the world of comics at CCA, because my way of getting into things for the first time is doing a master's degree in it. So <laughs> here I am, <laughs> learning every day. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can also relate for, I feel like, a lot of us the first queer content were just like fan art or fan fiction written by other queer folks, right? Of like, oh, like they have chemistry, like let's just make them be friends and more than friends and like have a good time, right? <laughs> so I, I can totally relate. How many of y'all like read queer fan art, fan fiction? Okay, yeah, yeah. So a lot of y'all know, right? That's, that's where our people are at. <laughs> All right, Kyla? So I got started with art and comics. Um, I guess I grew up reading the Sunday funnies in the paper. I really liked pickles. I'd call it the grandma grandpa comic. Um, <laughs> like that's that's not queer. It's just something I enjoyed. Um, and then I didn't really like have a concept of oh people like are actually cartoonists. People do this for their job until like kind of recently. But I also grew up reading like a lot of manga. I was really into Bleach. I have a lot of notebooks of pages of like panels from Bleach that I copied, just like the pages. And I was like that kid during, I just like trace over it. I was like, I love this comic so much. And I think that influenced me to be like, oh, I know people enjoy comics. Like what, it's like, it would be really cool to writing and drawing into something like that. Like what a far off dream. But like, I think um, a lot of my comic work kind of started during the pandemic, I had a friend named Sam Nakahiro who reached out on Instagram and she was going to um, the Center for Cartoon Studies and they do a project where they make an anthology. And she said, would you like to contribute a comic? And I said, oh, sure. But in my head, I was like, I haven't really made comics like ever. So like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, but I did that and I really enjoyed it. And being in the company of other cartoonists in that anthology, kind of encouraged me to look more into like, what does it take to make comics? What does it take to get published or even just do things more consistently? And I think that's kind of how I've gotten to this point. Yeah, just the support of friends and like encouragement. Yeah, yeah awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I think for me, it's the encouragement of the comics and zine community um, that have really um, opened comics, the door for comics. I've been doing art with intention um, since about 1996. I started out as a painter, um, doing a lot of acrylic on canvas and paper, and then um, took a turn towards illustration in 2010 when I started doing a series of 1,001 portraits of black men and bundling certain, you know, I'd take 30 here, 10 there, and bundle them and sell them as zines. And it's really um, through zine making that I encountered some of the people who are here today, like Ed Luce and John Macy is going to be speaking. Um, A.V. Jetter, I don't think is here, but does an amazing comic about zombies in downtown Oakland. Um, and uh, our organizer, uh, Justin Hall, and... Uh, 
Um, and uh, I always, I loved comics. Love and Rockets was probably the, the gateway drug for me in terms of comics that really got me into just obsessing and walking 45 minutes each way to buy a Love and Rockets every six weeks when I was in college. Um, but it looked like too much work to me. Um, and, you know, but meeting people who made comics gave me a sense, uh, really made me want to try to make my own. And so now I, I do, I, I have um, my feet firmly planted in illustration um, and writing. Um, I have a couple of illustrated books. Um, and But I also have my first collection of comics, gender studies, autobiographical comics. And, um, and you know, I don't think of an age when I create them. But uh, the audience has found me, so. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Um, one thing I really want to dive into is speaking of queer comics and queer content, but another subsect that Amanda, you kind of called to is the intersection of how cultural identity and different types of our own backgrounds intersect with queerness. And I think one thing I'm also very proud of is that we're a panel of all like folks of color too, which is great. And I want to be able to highlight those experiences. So for each of y'all, whether it's for your own work or like Sam, you had mentioned some changes you made in adapted works. How do you try to bring unique experiences of your life into your works? So we can start off with Awan now and go down. Um, the overwhelming majority of my work is about um, black people, black experiences, black community, um, African-American, but also Afro-diasporic. Two out of every 10 black people in America are Afro-Caribbean, Afro-European, African, or the children of African immigrants. And so, um, you know, that really becomes my lens. Um, and my goal is to, um, and I think part of it is, you know, maybe because I have the privilege of doing so, but I'm not really interested in creating the ideal role model of black experience, black life. I'm just interested in showing how it looks to me, how I experience it. Um, more voices, more representation, more images of, um, you know, I don't, I don't want us to be, my, I, my job as an artist and comic creator is to make sure that I don't leave people out simply because they are living more complicated lives than role modeling would suggest matter. So that has always been my challenge. Um, and my work is, is uh, very much informed by that. I love doing comics about those moments when I am incredibly awkward or ridiculous. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> just want to show, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be human. And I feel like that's my work is to humanize um, on our good days and our bad days and everything in between. Awesome. Thank you so much. Caleb? Um, I think I... I'm inspired a lot by my friends and like relationships, and I think I just wanted to bring some of that to the page. Um, I think it's just, um, I feel like a lot of advice given for people who want to write is like, well, sometimes I hear, oh, write what you know, or sometimes that, I've also heard that a lot of work that you do will turn out to be autobiographical, even if you don't necessarily mean it to be that way. And not necessarily in the sense that that's bad or good, just that a lot of people write from their experiences and that finds its way into their work, whether on purpose or not. And so I think that, um, I think that's true for me, especially. And for my middle grade comic, I just really wanted to write for, I don't know, like the Asian kids who like didn't see a lot of themselves in books growing up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for me, uh, it's a little bit different because I did grow up in India as an Indian. So, <laughs> so for me, it was very much like I was part of the mainstream culture. So I, I would say I had the privilege to look sort of outside of myself and my culture when I wanted to think of my art. Uh, right now, uh, the, the, the most important part of my culture that I'm thinking of bringing into my work, especially my comics work, is my experiences with traveling with family because uh, as a Bengali kid, uh, an Indian and Bengali kid, travel forms like a really, really integral part of our childhood and family dynamics. Because like every holidays, you'll have like families from all over the city packing up, going to the mountains or, or to, the, to the ocean or to the forest somewhere. And they're, they're gonna be in, in one space for like a week and seeing only each other's faces. Quarantine anyone? And it, it <laughs> brings up a lot of these uh, interesting family dynamics. And also, uh, I feel like as a child, going on these family trips, looking at nature, 
being encouraged to uh, appreciate a place and culture for what it is forms a really core part of my identity. So I think that's something I really am trying to bring into my work. Uh, like, how do we as tourists see places that we visit for what they are? Like, be it the nature, be it the people, the food, just like a holistic experience of space. And, and I feel like, in a weird way, that is tied to my cultural identity as a Bengali person. So right now I'm working on my thesis for my master's and it's about a family trip. And I'm trying to really include more like one, those subtle experiences so that if a Bengali person were to pick up the book, they would immediately see themselves in it. So that's me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and I think for me, like I deal, my work deals a lot with identity, um, like my own personal written work, um, not just in the queer aspect, but um, I'm Filipino and Mexican, and I feel like growing up, there was sort of like a weird straddle thing internally where I just didn't feel like I was completely one or the other, like mi mixed kid things. Um, but in the sense that like, because neither was, neither part of my ethnic identity wasn't white, it was much harder for me to find like media to relate to in that sense. So a lot of what I write now um, deals with just the, the what's the word? Like the, the internal conflict with oneself um, of trying to figure out how to navigate like these different aspects of your identity when you don't full, like fully feel a part of it. Um, and then how, like I said before, how that informs um, like queerness. So all pretty much all of my characters are queer. And so I think for me, my own personal journey of like stepping into something that was a little bit more comfortable came along with starting to understand um, like the Filipino aspect of myself. And so I think understanding like that portion of your, like one portion of your identity, it just serves to inform and like other portions of your identity because it's just all intersected in you. Um, and so that's really something that I try to get across in pretty much like all the work that they do. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sweet. So we um, have about like seven minutes left for the rest of this before we open it up. So just a quick reminder to keep the questions in your head. I know this is going by so quickly, um, but I want to spend this time now to kind of dig a little deeper into each of y'all's books and works and careers. Um, I've read um, a lot of y'all's stuff, huge, huge fan. Um, so I'll start off with Kyla. I know you are working on Foxlight and you said it's coming out um, in like a couple of years, right? Okay, um, but you, while you're working on this, you also, as you've shown here, have collabed on so many cool anthologies and like other types of um, books and um, comics. So I love to ask, you for the audience. Um, how do you decide sort of which projects to take on? And then how does one even get published? Um, so for the first question, how do I decide what projects to take on? I think specifically for lettering work right now, a lot of it is really who you know. It's a lot of connections. But what I did was I um, sometimes I get in a mood where I'm like, oh, what if I did this and I just go, what if I think like, um, what if I think like with the confidence of a white man and yeah, I yeah, just yeah. Always. open up my email, I go into a state and I just go, okay, I'm going to write a cold email. So that's what happened for working with Viz Media on Manga. Also, oh, you just cold emailed I just everyone. cold emailed wow. like one editor and he was checking his emails that day. <laughs> and so oh, he gave me a lettering test and I turned it back in and they said, great, we'll put you on your our roster. Um, and then he, for Viz Media, they do this thing called simulpubs, where um, on different days of the week, but let's take the Sunday weekly Shonen Jump magazine. Um, so there are a ton of series that come out in Japan. And what Viz Media does in America is they publish those um, series at the same time as they do in Japan. So you're on like a tight schedule. And they said, let's put you on this to like, test out if you're like good to work with. And I was like, sure. And they said, let's put you on this thing called Super Smartphone. It has 
300 lines of text per chapter, and the turnaround is 24 hours, and you have to retouch screen tone and cell phones, and now I never want to work on another cell phone manga. But yeah, now I'm like, oh, technology, my phone, grr. <laughs> um, but yeah, for manga, it's a lot of, you get assigned things, and you do have some flexibility in turning things down or asking, oh, I've heard of this thing. If you see it, I'd be interested in it. Um, and for other projects like um, the Freddie Mercury one and the outside, I was reached out to, and I was really grateful for those opportunities to just work with a lot of cool artists and like creators. Um, and then all the small stuff, like my mini comics, most of them came out of Utot Comics, where my friends are just like, you should make comics. I'm going to text you until you make a comic. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of that. Um, could you repeat your second question? Oh, just like how you get published. Uh, for getting published, I think I was on Twitter a lot <laughs> in 2020. And I thought, oh, like, I was just like really into like, oh, how do you like publish a book, like what goes into that and what kind of work do you need to do? Um, I think I took like a couple classes in like high school that were kind of creative writing classes and we talked a little bit about the publishing process. And so I just like thought back at that and I was like, what if I do that while I'm in limbo with jobs and like internships? Cause I had just graduated and was waiting to hear back on things that never materialized. So I was like, oh, I'll just put all my efforts into like book publishing, which is not a great gamble, but it, it worked out and I'm grateful for that. Awesome, thank you. Um, next, I wanna jump over to Sam. Um, also, we have like two minutes for the three of y'all, so <laughs> let's, let's get like the TLDR answers. <laughs> um, but for Sam, um, you also worked on uh, Webtoons, you worked on Night Owls and Summer Skies. And I think one thing we've talked about uh, between the two of us was like how you, um, when it was an adaptation, right, of like a famous, I guess, novel, novel yeah, a famous novel, and you kind of put your own um, culture into some of the characters and, and like switched it up a little bit, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in the novel, all the characters are American. But uh, they were like, since, so the team at Webtoon was like, since food and family and culture is really important to the story, and you're an Indian uh, artist, so what do you think uh, of making this one character Indian? So we can include more of the food and like the culture and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, which was really special, because like, I was reached out to by Webtoon to do this project. So in a sense, it could have been anyone. But it, it is kind of comforting for me to know that it is a specific thing and it's different because it was me. Mm -hmm. Like not mm -hmm. like if it was another artist, it would have been their culture. So it's like there is this, that this really like personal touch that I was able to give to the comic, which I'm like really happy about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. It's like I, I am the artist. I'm going to take control yeah. and make it my story. I love that. Um, Amanda, so for Map Makers, you said you were the main artist and then you also co-wrote, is that correct? Um, I didn't write anything, but I was listed <laughs> as a co-author. Okay, cool, cool. All right, extra credit. Um, so you mainly did the, so you did the art primarily and then you worked with another writer, right? Yeah, I'd love for you to talk about um, how is it like working as a writer? I know some folks might really specialize in just one or the other. And then now that you're kind of pitching something that you are also both writing and drawing, can you let us know sort of the differences and maybe even the challenges of both? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think with being just the artist, it it's easier in terms of like for ideation. Um, Cause when I'm, I'm a writer, now that I'm writing and like doing my own thing, um, it is a lot of like sitting down, hunkering down, really getting those ideas out. Um, but as just an artist, um, I also enjoy, like I, I enjoy telling my own stories, but there's something really nice about being, telling the story as the artist, because with graphic novels, it's just a lot of the storytelling is going to be in the images. Um, so it's really fun collaborating with the writer um, in building this world. So he didn't really have like an idea of what he wanted these characters to look like. So then he like is, he's like an absolute sweetheart. And so he gave me so much room to kind of develop 
uh, the characters how I want to see them, how, how I would want to see these characters out in the book um, and like the world as well. Um, and so there's just a lot of going back and forth fun, like fun and trust between us um, in kind of crafting this. And um, what makes it really fun as well is that we come up with ideas that like we couldn't have thought of ourselves. Um, and so that, yeah, it's very different from just working on stuff on your own, but the positive to it as well, uh, working on stuff on my own is that I do, I am allowed to be much more like intimate with like the ideas and like the themes and all of that stuff um, coming directly from me, um, which I really enjoy because that's something that I've always enjoyed as an artist, um, but yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and then last but not least for Awan, um, we did get the green lights for uh, a few more minutes, but for you, um, you've made so many books, you're a professor, um, yeah, the list just goes on and on, right? But I would love to ask um, if Kid You was here right now, like in the audience, you know, and it's like looking at this panel, um, how would Kid You react? Like, what would you want to tell Kid You and what would Kid You say to you right now? Um, it's an interesting question because um, um, I, my path has been circuitous into art. Um, I could tell Kid You, um, you can actually take art classes in college and you won't melt. Um, <laughs> go ahead and do that. Um, because it was a huge missed opportunity to not um, take, um, to even pursue art studies in, as an undergraduate. Um, but it would have changed my path and I'm really pleased with where I, how I got there. Um, I think Kid You would be really amused um, and really amazed and, um, and would say, what are you waiting for? Do more, do more. Um, and, um, you know, I did a children's book in November. My first children's book came out and I think Kid You would love that because I kind of fell in love with art and with writing through children's books um, back in the 1970s when I was a kid. So, yeah. 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 No, I love that. I think every time I need inspiration or any time I'm like, oh man, like, I don't know if I can keep drawing anymore. I just think about, you know, five, 10 year old me who would have been like, yo, this is sick. Like, what are you doing? Stop hesitating. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. A quick round of applause for everyone. Cool. So we have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and we'll get the mic to you. Um, please don't shout anything out. Uh, wait until you have the mic to ask the question. So raise your hand. Hi, I'm proud. Oh, you got one over here. Hi, panelists. Uh, when you're uh, when you're making a story for kids or for uh, middle schoolers or, or high schoolers, does that affect how you think about the way you approach the art, like the way you might lay out a page or the, may, the way that you might want to graphically represent a story idea that you have um, versus the way you would do it if you were uh, making for an adult audience? Question, is this for everyone or for a specific person? Yeah, for, for anyone who finds that interesting enough to answer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> fight, fight, fight. I can go. Um, I think personally for me, not so much, but maybe so in how like I choose to convey expressions um, and like highlight, like what I choose to highlight. I feel like when, like now that I've, so I did like middle grade, um, for map makers and then now that I'm working on stuff for teens, the teen stuff tends to like lean a little bit quieter um, and a little bit more contemplative. Um, and I think that's just, that comes with like the nature of a lot of the themes that are in like uh, teenage books. Um, so yeah, I, I would say yeah, like I would say yeah. Like I think there is like an energy that I really enjoy like putting into like kids books because a lot of them, um, there's like a lot of adventure, there's a lot of like friendship and I think, that does kind of inform how the panels are laid out, how the characters express. Um, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Any more questions? One over here. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay. So um, I guess I was wondering about 
I, a lot of uh, like queer comics and cartoons that I watch, I noticed that um, homophobia isn't like always written into the stories that much. And I'm, wo I'm wondering. Wait, sorry, is or isn't? It isn't. Like there's a lot of times where the story, it's, it's like all uh, rainbows and smiles. They're just not really like, they're not really talking about like the struggles. There's representation, but it's not necessarily speaking about um, what it's like. So I'm just wondering, um, do you think it's important to put that into stories and why, or like, do you notice that? Or <laughs> okay, so in Night Owls and Summer Skies specifically, there is homophobia, but there is also like the, sort of the flip side of everything, sunshine and rainbows. Um, I feel like, uh, especially for all ages and uh, comics aimed at a younger audience, uh, we need a healthy mix of both uh, because when kids are growing up and they see uh, something that is normalized in, in the media that they're consuming, they're like, they, they will internalize the fact that, oh, it's normal. And uh, in my opinion, we can, we can like maybe push the homophobia like to like later stages of age. Then you can be like, okay, now we're coming to reality a little bit. But inside me, my base has already formed that being queer is normal. So like that is kind of where I come at it, at it from. Uh, like queer media also deserves uh, representation where it is not uh, like necessary for it to touch on um, prejudice. So that's me. I want? Um, you know, I was thinking, I think similarly, um, you know, um, it's kind of like, a, you know, if I, you do a book about, say, a black um, experience and it's not, most of black life isn't defined by the experiences, the way that people who are not black perceive black people, which is essentially what racism is. And in some ways, homophobia is the way that people who are not queer, trans, non-binary perceive that community. But most of, um, I feel like it becomes a really great way of centering queer folks and trans and non-binary folks to not necessarily center homophobia, except in those instances in which it's very, salient and very relevant. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, it feels like, in some ways it feels like a power move, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll quickly add my two cents that um, I'm not like, I, I'm like 28, I feel like I'm kind of in between a lot of different generations here, but uh, growing up, I feel like a lot of the media I saw had a ton of homophobia, where it was, it was almost as if every gay story was a sad sob story, you know? <laughs> and um, I remember talking to other creators and be like, oh man, where are happy stories, you know? Like why always just be sad and mopey about like no one accepting us. Um, so I think it's actually refreshing to hear that there's people out there who they've only consumed very happy queer stories. And I'm glad that there's now both sides of the spectrum. You know, you can have whatever you want based on what mood you're feeling. So yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. Awesome. Um, we have two minutes left. Anyone have a quick question they want to ask? All right. Oh, okay. Here. Very quick, because we, we do have to kick everyone out for the next panel soon, <laughs> which unless y'all stay for, it is queer horror. It will be a wonderful panel as well. Hi, um, real quick, do you have any um, messages or themes that you think um, queer and trans kids need to hear from uh, the media? And are those things, are there any of those things that you have put into your own work? For anyone. I have my two cents, especially, um, uh, like I cannot speak for uh, trans experiences specifically, but for me, I am an asexual person uh, and aspects are notoriously very, uh, like the representation is kind of sad. <laughs> like it's very hard to find stories uh, centering asexual, aromantic, aplatonic people. And uh, I feel like uh, I, I would say that, <sighs> We are such a small part of the population that I want every ASPEC kid especially to know that they are not alone. Because in any time I publish a comic talking about my experiences, I will invariably get responses like, I thought I was alone, I didn't know, I didn't know this had a name. And it is so, so, so uncommon to come across another ASPEC person just in the wild that I feel like uh, 
I, I really want to tell them that there are other people like you and your experiences are not like you're not an island or weird. So I guess that kind of extends to like the whole LGBTQIA plus community. Mm -hmm. Um, I also feel like as someone who is non-binary themselves, um, I, I, I enjoy like the like stories about trans and non-binary experiences. Um, and it's so hard to like capture like this like whole experience that is so varied um, in a single piece of media. But what I really do enjoy when I see it um, is the idea that's explored that I mean, like, not, none of it is concrete. Like, all of it is, like, a lot of it is fluid. For some people, it is concrete. Um, but it, it is more fluid than you think. And I think I see a lot of that, a lot more of that now, like, over the past, like, few years. Um, but personally, that's something that I would like to see a lot more. Like, it's okay that you explore one, like, aspect of yourself, and then you find out, like, maybe two years later that it's not really working for you. Um, and I think sort of incorporating that a little bit more um, is something personally I would want to see because I think that kind of just like feeds into the fact that like we're all just people, we're all just human um, and we're always learning and changing, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you so much. Um, let's give a final round of applause to our panel. <laughs> yeah, woo, yeah! Thank you all so much again. Um, Please, if y'all would like, stay for the next panel, which is Queer Horror. But if not, please check out all of their wonderful works out on the tables right outside the auditorium. Thank y'all so much. Thank you.